Hi, how's it going? On this episode of Home Water Dispatch, I'm on Eleuthera in the Bahamas, uh, and actually at the southern end of Eleuthera, a place called Cape Eleuthera, uh, and behind me is a location called No Name Harbor. Uh, it's a relatively significant location uh, when it comes to uh, bonefish and discovering where bonefish go to spawn. Uh, while working uh, for the Cape Lurthru Institute and bringing together some wonderful collaborators, uh, we used acoustic telemetry, uh, which involves putting receivers out in the environment and surgically in implanting uh, bonefish with transmitters. And earlier iterations of that project, we kind of kept to the tidal creeks and the mangrove creeks that are to the east of here. And over time, after monitoring the movement patterns of bonefish going in and out of the tidal creeks and along the shoreline a little bit, there were periods of time when they just kind of disappeared for a while. And uh, that was an initial clue in terms of maybe where they, they might be moving to go do something uh, that's tied to their biology and ecology. And so we expanded the acoustic telemetry array. We did some manual tracking. We used a lot of different tools and techniques and that brought us to here, to No Name Harbor. And uh, the uh, times at which those bonefish were, were um, not as frequently detected in the tidal creeks was around the full and the new moon. And there's a lot of other reef fish um, that are out there, are tropical fish, a lot of fish that spawn based on lunar cycles. Um, and in the ocean, it's because of tidal movements and distributing your progeny far and wide and all sorts of stuff. We won't get into that uh, today. Um, but over time, we were able to discover that, that the bonefish were coming to this place called No Name Harbor. No Name Harbor, um, this is an old, uh, was an old resort. Um, they did some dredging here way back in the day, created a little deep water um, area for people to potentially bring their, bring their boats. Um, and, but what it ultimately did was create some deep water sort of transitional habitat between the flats that are that way and between the deep water of the Exuma Sound, which is that way. Uh, and based on um, tagging lots of bonefish with acoustic transmitters and looking at their movement patterns, we're also able to figure out these places where we might want to observe them uh, at certain times of the year to look at their behavior. And which is, brings me back to this lo particular location, this incredible soft spot in my heart for this location, because this was the location where we first observed, I think anybody first observed or, or documented scientifically that bonefish start to porpoise and they come out of the water uh, as the sun starts to set, the sun hits the horizon and these bonefish would start porpoising in the school that's back here. Um, and they would make their way out and follow the coastline to the deep water drop off of the Exuma Sound. Uh, that was spectacular to see. You don't anticipate a bonefish, which is a benthivore, right? They feed on the bottom. We like to fish for them with crab patterns and shrimp and everything else. Um, but to have them start to porpoise and uh, it was uh, incredibly exciting to see. It was, it, it was atypical for a bonefish behavior. Um, and we tracked them offshore uh, and some of the fish, we had uh, transmitters with pressure sensors in them and we had were able to detect that they actually went offshore and they ended up going down into deep water and literally within 24 hours after that or the next morning those fish after we downloaded receivers were detected way back in their their home waters in the flats i mean technically these are all their home waters right but they use this part of their home waters for a certain part of their life history uh, which is tied to their reproductive ecology which is super important right because if bonefish can't reproduce, then there's not going to be future babies coming into the population to support, you know, the recreational fishery or to su or to support the ecosystem because bonefish play an important role as benthivores up on the flats as they forage and muck about. And and this, so this brings me to the the series of observations that not only the the porpoising but the fact about where we end up seeing a lot of these what we call a pre-spawn aggregation site. 
Uh, and these tend to be in these transitional habitats between shallow and deep. They need, tend to be closer to, to deep water drop-offs because there's some hypotheses that we think that bonefish uh, need something called pneumatic assist where they, they porpoise, they pull in lots of uh, air into their, um, into their stomachs uh, and as they move out to spawn and they dive down, that air compresses and then when they come up to the surface, they, they hydrate their eggs, they make them very slippery, that air expands and it gets the, can squish out all the, all the eggs. Um, anyway, some cool hypotheses, <laughs> some cool observations. Um, but these preliminary, or these observations, we've published this, uh, the results of this study and we've done some other studies, this led the way to a bigger initiative uh, that uh, with a lot of other collaborators with BTT uh, and to look at where these bonefish spawning aggregate, pre-spawn aggregation sites are, uh, to think about how we can protect them from future development, uh, protect them potentially from maybe over harvesting if they're subsistence fisheries, and also really understanding this idea of connectivity, right? We don't think of bonefish of going out into, you know, over 3,000 feet of water, um, but for this segment of their life history, they actually do. Um, and also using these transitional habitats that they actually, you know, use for a certain sliver of time in their life, but it's critically important for the maintenance of their populations. So um, I, I think that this is a really good place to stop. I'm, I'm going to try to do some more episodes, but um, I wanted to come here to No Name Harbor to talk about bonefish spawning aggregations or pre-spawning aggregation sites, to think about that connectivity uh, between the flats and the deeper water of the environments, to think about the people that we need to bring to the table to have discussions about development of these areas um, so that we're not, <laughs> excuse me, so that we're not messing up. Um, bonefish habitat that we don't typically consider as important, right? Because they are creatures of the flats, but not really. Um, so, or, uh, so we need to think about that all in consideration, think about things more his holistically when it comes to the management of bonefish and coastal ecosystems, tying that back into connectivity and all that other fun stuff. Anyway, I'm gonna park that here and uh, hopefully end up with a few more other episodes of Home Water Dispatch uh, from Eleuther in the Bahamas. See y'all. Oh, last thing, on the YouTube channel, on Fish Forward, there's some really cool videos of bonefish spawning aggregations that uh, I was doing or happened to do with um, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust in Abaco. After this discovery, we expanded, but uh, check out the other YouTube videos that I have on the Fish Forward channel about some really cool bigger aggregations and porpoising and all that other cool stuff. Anyway, yeah, see ya, bye.